again, welcome. Good morning, good evening to all of you for participating at this human rights conversation. I'm Felix Kirchmeier and I'm your moderator for the next hour and a half. First of all, let me welcome our speakers, uh, Clément Voulet, Special Rapporteur on the Right to Freedom of Assembly and Association, Kumba Boli Bari, Special Rapporteur on the Right to Education, and Yuval Shani, Professor of Law at Hebrew University and former member of the Human Rights Committee. I would like to thank all of you already uh, from the start for taking the time to engage in this conversation today. I will introduce the speakers uh, in more detail when I give them the floor just uh, when they will be speaking. Let me also mention that this is a public meeting. We are recording the meeting also to make it available for those who were interested to join but could not make it at this uh, time or day. So the meeting is being recorded as a public meeting. The topic of today, universally digital. I was struggling a little bit with finding a title, shifting around the words one first, then the other. But basically what I would wish to discuss today with our guests is, um, is exactly those impacts of the digitalization on the universality and the universal enjoyment of human rights. Digitalization affects in many ways the enjoyment of human rights. That's a slogan that human rights apply online as they apply offline is necessary, but surely not sufficient to address this reality. Additionally, the opportunities and challenges created by digitalization do not merely apply to online settings. Offline use of big data, digital storage, etc., raise their specific questions as well. <clears throat> this human rights conversation aims at adding the angle to what this means. Uh, sorry, um, the, the impact of digitalization on the issues covered um, by special procedure mandates of the Human Rights Council have been addressed by a number of mandate holders. In particular, we um, know about the reports on freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, right to privacy. But in this human rights conversation, uh, we'd like to add the angle of what this means for the universality of human rights. Does digitalization provide a path to strengthen universal enjoyment of human rights? Does the digital spread of information enhance universal understanding and knowledge about human rights? And what new challenges actually does digitalization pose to the universally recognized human rights as defined in documents that have been written in the pre-digitalization era? The COVID pandemic has expedited processes already in place and probably offered some additional insights. As the move to online and hybrid meetings and conferences has been acclaimed to enhance accessibility, and allow for more universal participation, practical barriers quickly became evident. For the enjoyment of a number of rights where digital uplift may suggest steps towards universal enjoyment of the right, the same applies. Digitalization might have brought positive aspects to the realization of the right to education, for example, but the digital gap remains and puts some of this gain surely into question. Academics are also calling for the recognition of new e-rights, and the question is, would this add to the universality of human rights? Would it rather detract or create additional occasions for discrimination? <clears throat> this discussion today uh, uh, constitutes an integral part of an ongoing research project at the Geneva Academy, looking at universality of human rights, a project supported by the Swiss Confederation, which aims at uh, producing an output paper that uh, tries to consolidate and uh, really revisit our understanding of the various criticism and tensions around universality and the narratives that are currently being discussed. So with this, I would like to um, turn to uh, the distinguished speakers that we have here with us today, uh, starting with Clément Voulet. Clément is a um, special rapporteur on freedom of assembly and association, and also a researcher here at the Geneva Academy. Clément Voulet was appointed as UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and Association in April 2018, starting his mandate in 18. So prior to this appointment, he led the International Service for Human Rights to support human rights defenders from states in transition and coordinated the organization's work in Africa as the advocacy director. <clears throat> and as I said, I'm very proud to say that Clément is also here with us at the Geneva Academy, where he holds a research position. Now, in early 2019, Clément, you undertook also a consultation um, a visit to Silicon Valley, 
to inform your report to the Human Rights Council on freedom of assembly and association in the digital age. I think that's a very good start for us too, because again, what, what did you see? What is the impact of digitalization on the rights that you monitor under your mandate? And what does that mean in the context of universality? So the floor is yours, Kimmo. Thank, thank, thank you very much, uh, Feliz. Let, uh, let me first thank uh, Geneva Academy for uh, creating this opportunity for us to uh, have this conversation on the uh, issue of digitalization and universality. And I think this is an issue that is involving. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm not sure that this is um, a topic that can be uh, in one hour or two hours <laughs> be discussed completely because um, digital age is um, uh, the one that really rapidly is changing, rapidly is moving. I think that's why also it also poses uh, some challenge uh, uh, because of its nature of changing, but also uh, uh, creating threats and also opportunity at the same time. Um, yes, in, uh, in 2019, when I, uh, 2018, when I took uh, up my mandate as a UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and Association. Um, I, one of the issues that was brought to my attention uh, was the issue of how digital age impacts the enjoyment of this fundamental freedom and how the new technology we are seeing, the new space that we are seeing, they are really important for the enjoyment of this, uh, 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 these fundamental freedoms. So yes, I, I took up um, some consultation with civil society, but most importantly, I also went to Silicon Valley to discuss with um, a service provider, with uh, social media there, and, and trying to understand better how their platform and the product that they are putting, how these products uh, affect human rights, uh, positively and negatively, and what uh, should we do together in order to ensure as a mandate holder, that uh, those tools that is put in our, dis uh, our disposal, the disposal of community, are uh, effectively used to promote human rights and also how we can also work together to ensure also that um, uh, the sta states and other actors are not using uh, this great opportunity or this platform to harm uh, other, uh, the exercise of fundamental freedom. So in, the, in this report that I presented in 2019, um, as a result of this uh, consultation uh, to, um, to the Human Rights Council, I affirm that digital technology are uh, tools, but they are also space, you know, space that expand the enjoyment of, of the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association. This report also recognized that digital technology have created many opportunities for civic participation and the exercise of assembly and association rights. And that's uh, from uh, uh, social media to machine learning, uh, we saw how uh, these rights, our rights are expanded uh, from the physical space to the online spa space. And also we saw also that how the, the digital technology also um, build or expand the capacity of individual and civil society to advance human rights and to innovate on, uh, uh, for the social change. When, let me talk briefly, uh, when, when uh, we talk about the peaceful assembly, for example, we know that social media like Facebook, WhatsApp, Telegram, YouTube, they increase the capacity of mobilization today uh, of community, social movements and, and uh, poli political party use those technologies today to mobilize people on the streets. If we look back a few, year, uh, a few years ago, uh, it was not possible to mobilize as we can mobilize in one hour today, people around the common interests to go on the streets and also to, uh, uh, to express their, their, their view. One of example, and when I went also in, um, in 2018 on my country visits in Armenia, I was also really impressed on uh, how this technology impact really the Velvet Revolution in Armenia. Uh, by, as you know, during this time, the, 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 which also bring uh, in power the Prime Minister, uh, Nikola Pashenko, social media was heavily used, not only to mobilize on the street, but also to guide also 
uh, uh, protester on how they can prevent uh, uh, police attack or how they can ensure that uh, they, 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 there is no clash between them and, uh, and the police. So one of the things that I learned from this is not only that this, this social movement was able to mobilize on the street, but also it helped to keep this movement peaceful because then the participants of the protest were keeping contact with uh, the, the leaders or those who organized the protest and they were able to guide and any time that there was violence that emerged from somewhere, they are able also to ask participants to not move on this area. So this technology was so important. We can also talk, we can give us an example also the Sudan revolution recently. Uh, we can also give example of uh, Black Lives Matter and we know that the Black Lives Matter movements uh, for racial equality began with the use of a hashtag to mobilize community in mass protests in the United States uh, um, and other part of the world against police violence and uh, systematic racism towards people of African descent. We can also give the example of many youth movements across the world, including those who are uh, defending climate change, uh, future, uh, future for Friday for Future. We have also road safety movement. So we can see that in the, in the area of the protest today, social movements, in particular Facebook, those who are more uh, uh, powerful uh, traditional tools, uh, YouTube become a tools that people are using to exercise their rights, but also people are using also to make change, to make sure that their voice are heard. This, uh, it's also, uh, this uh, digital technology, it also provides human rights defenders with an important tool because at the same time that this tool is used uh, to mobilize, it also used to monitor the human rights violation during peaceful protests. We saw how many streamlined we have during the protests. So it's quite now very easy to know what is going on within, uh, within the protest. It's easy also to see the police conduct. It's also easy also to, to be able to analyze uh, if police is, uh, by, uh, is using uh, force according to the law or is misusing his power during the protest. And also to see again how participant behavior during this, uh, uh, this protest through streamline, for example. Um, it also increased uh, the, the, the capacity of the lawyer, for example, to provide evidence today. Then to uh, many tools that we have today, Lawyers are able also to recall, lawyers are able to provide, to provide evidence at the court whenever there is an issue around the use of violence or misconduct of the police. So this is uh, some of the things that I would like to, to, to give you in, when it's come to the, to the, to the uh, when it's come to the peaceful protest. There are so many other tools that, uh, as you know, we have online campaign, like Me Too campaign, so many uh, today women's uh, action today are also empowered by this uh, by the social movements. So these movements, this uh, technology brought quite a lot. On the association rights, for example, we know that uh, today so social media are used as a platform for civil society to organize by communities, by marginalized groups, so they can organize themselves and tend to also the encryption. They are able also to form groups without making sure that they, they, they can discuss among themselves, they can strategize what, what was not uh, able, uh, 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 possible before. Because when the physical space is not possible, or marginalized groups are under threat, today they are using social media as one way to be able to organize themselves, but also to convey their message to the uh, international com community. And we saw also during COVID-19, in particular during the lockdown, how this platform, uh, social media was uh, uh, was important as a gathering for civil society to attend uh, human rights mechanism uh, discussion to also connect with victim on the ground and many people even say that during this time uh, civil society was able also to reach more to reach more victim than ever because then in many countries there was efforts also to equip there was effort also to use social media so it's helped this kind of connection. And another thing is important also to highlight is also uh, the fact also that, uh, uh, for example, that it also increased. If you look at the, uh, at the le le let's talk about artificial, artificial intelligence system, for example. It has also increased the efficiency and improved management of data by the civil society working on the, in the field of education, for example, 
or climate justice or humanitarian assistance or urban planning. We will see how now civil society through this use of, of this technology can process quickly the data. We know also that this technology help also today to really see some of the violation happening in an area and location where we were not able to, to have uh, uh, some of this. So just to say that um, both for the assembly and association rights, digital te technology brought quite a lot. But it's true, the main question is that, did we reach what we call the universality of human rights? How, how these social media are able to reach everyone, are able also to ensure that all human rights can be discussed or all human rights can be discussed. One of the things that uh, I want also to say, and I think when we, we start uh, uh, in, uh, in um, the discussion, we can talk about that. Well, this technology brought many opportunity. It's come also with very threats against uh, our rights. And threats both coming from states, threats coming also from some malign use of this technology, but also threat also coming from the lack of companies to be able to protect this space for the, we have a surveillance issues, we have div, uh, divide, uh, uh, um, um, internet divide, which today to make some many, many part of the world are, are not able to connect as other parts. We have also, when we look at the COVID-19 time, COVID-19 also show us that when it comes to the right to education, I think which Kumba will talk, we saw how the world was divided. Whereas, some places it was important to implement this uh, um, lockdown and ensure that these rights, uh, the exercise of rights are continued. In some part of the world, we also know that it wasn't possible. And only those who are, those who are able to connect uh, are able also to, to, uh, to, to enjoy these fundamental rights, including education, including access to justice and many other things. And also, I think in, uh, in the debate, we can talk about that the facial recognition technology, what kind of threat they pose to our right today, cybercrime law. So I think some of these things, I, I would like to leave it here and then we can have this discussion uh, when, we, when it comes to the, the threats and, and also the gaps that we are seeing in the, uh, in, in, in the use of this technology. So thank you very much uh, for this. Thank you. Thank you, Timo, for this uh, <coughs> initial statement. And indeed you mentioned uh, uh, quite uh, broadly the, the positive effects of digitalization, also on the more universal enjoyment of the rights and also the enabling nature of it. Um, but just in the end, uh, point to the potential, well, to, to actually the, the negative effects also that we'll be surely discuss in the ensuing uh, debate. But uh, you also mentioned already the right to education. So that's for me the perfect uh, lead over to our next speaker. Bumbo <clears throat> Boli Bari, who is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Education. Dr. Kumba Boli Bari took office in 2016 following her appointment at the 32nd session of the Human Rights Council. And she holds a PhD in economics, uh, economic history from Sheikh Antibiot University in Senegal, and is also the former Minister of Education and Literacy of Burkina Faso and has consulted widely for various governments and international <coughs> organizations on the right to education. Uh, Kumba, already in 2016, your predecessor um, dedicated a report to the right to education in the digital age, but you very recently in 2020 issued a report on the impact of COVID-19 <coughs> on the right to education. Kumba just already uh, referred to that one. So uh, what do the findings of those two reports mean for our discussion today? How is the right to education doing in the post-COVID digital age? And uh, what's the universal um, nature of this right uh, and also the universal uh, enjoyment of this right what, what being impacted by digitalization? So uh, Kumba, over to you. Merci, merci beaucoup, uh, Monsieur Kishmeyer. Uh, C'est toujours un plaisir uh, pour moi de participer à cet espace de dialogue que vraiment l'Académie de Genève a créé. Uh, et c'est avec bien sûr beaucoup de plaisir que je me retrouve avec uh, mon frère et collègue uh, Clément Voulet, mais aussi uh, tous les autres uh, qui sont présents dans ce panel. Je parle de Monsieur Yuval Chani. 
Euh, merci encore, euh, bien sûr, euh, euh, Madame Yasmina, euh, qui a contribué, bien sûr, à ce que ça s'organise de la meilleure des façons. Je suis désolée parce que la voix est un peu euh, enrouée, mais j'espère je, je, que euh, je me ferai entendre. Euh, je, je, je pense que suite un peu à, au message de, de mon collègue euh, Voulet, euh, je ne voudrais peut-être pas revenir sur les enjeux parce qu'il les a déjà bien mis en exergue. Euh, ils sont clairs, ils sont vraiment évidents euh, en ce qui concerne les droits de l'homme, donc les droits humains, euh, y compris les droits à l'éducation. Euh, parce que c'est s'assurer, euh, pour nous, c'est s'assurer que la numérisation euh, prenne en compte, bien sûr, les enjeux du droit à l'éducation. Et quand on dit les enjeux du droit à l'éducation, c'est s'assurer, bien sûr, que chaque citoyen, chaque citoyenne a accès à une éducation euh, gratuite, de qualité et publique. Et pour nous, c'est ça d'abord la ligne et la vision. Euh, et, et si on arrive vraiment à, à s'assurer qu'on s'accorde sur cette ligne et cette vision, que chaque être humain, quel qu'il soit, quelle que soit sa condition euh, de vie, quel que soit là où il habite, euh, qu'il soit nomade, qu'il soit pêcheur, qu'il soit issu de familles pauvres, qu'il soit réfugié, migrant, euh, qu'il soit du nord ou du sud, euh, que chaque être humain, quel que soit euh, qui il est, euh, puisse effectivement jouir des outils euh, numériques dans ce processus-là de, 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 de mondialisation pour s'assurer qu'on règle l'effectivité de son droit à l'éducation. Parce que c'est ça l'enjeu. L'enjeu, ce n'est pas d'accéder aux outils et aux instruments. Mais l'enjeu, c'est justement de s'assurer que nous avons l'effectivité du droit à l'éducation. Ce, ce sont deux choses complètement différentes. Et je pense que des, des fois, il faut absolument pouvoir placer cet enjeu-là et de le faire de façon très visible pour les États, pour les décideurs et pour les gouvernants. L'enjeu, c'est aujourd'hui pour les États, parce que je vois que dans la plupart des États, avec cet impact du COVID, qui est déjà, euh, comme on dit, dans l'histoire déjà de notre humanité, on voit déjà qu'avant le COVID, on avait plus d'un milliard d'êtres humains qui étaient analphabètes. La majorité, c'était toujours ces populations les plus marginalisées qui étaient concernées. Et avec cela, il y a un potentiel énorme que l'outil numérique, vous voulez parler tout à l'heure de l'intelligence artificielle, hein, de tout, ce, tout cet appareillage de big data, euh, de robotisme, tout cela, ça existe. Et l'humanité, aujourd'hui, en dispose. Mais qu'est-ce que ça signifie concrètement pour quelqu'un qui se situe en milieu rural et qui soit, par exemple, une personne vivant en situation de handicap Qu'est-ce que ça signifie pour elle Ou, ou issue d'une famille pauvre ou issu euh, d'un groupe de réfugiés ou de groupes de migrants. Qu'est-ce que ça signifie pour ces personnes et, et en fait, c'est là aussi qu'il y a le hiatus à la fois entre euh, cette flambée contextuelle de cette technologie qui existe en tant que potentiel énorme, mais à côté, bien sûr, cette question aussi de discrimination euh, entre les possibilités et les opportunités euh, offertes au niveau des différents euh, pays, au niveau des différents continents, mais aussi au niveau, au niveau des différents euh, publics. Euh, on parlait tout à l'heure de, euh, de ces inégalités. Euh, quand vous prenez le continent africain, vous avez à peine souvent peut-être 89% hein, d'enseignants de, de, hein, ou d'apprenants qui n'ont qui même pas accès à Internet. Et puis, à côté, d'autres sont à 100 Voilà. Et ça, vous voyez déjà qu'on ne peut pas parler de, de numérisation quand déjà l'accès à l'Internet constitue un grand, grand, grand handicap. Et ça, je pense que c'est vraiment important euh, de le mettre aussi euh, sur la table. Le deuxième élément, pour moi, en termes d'enjeu, euh, qu'il ne faut pas peut-être perdre de vue, euh, et c'est le, le débat aussi aujourd'hui. Est-ce qu'il faut considérer 
euh, toutes les questions de, numéris, de numérisation, toutes ces, tous ces instruments qui existent euh, comme une panacée. Est-ce qu'il faut euh, dire qu'il faut la course hein, Parce qu'on voit qu'il y a plusieurs États, plusieurs gouvernements, plusieurs décideurs qui ont décidé d'investir énormément hein, dans l'achat, dans l'acquisition de ces plateformes, de ces outils, de ces instruments. Mais est-ce que c'est ça l'enjeu Est-ce que l'enjeu, ce n'est pas de dire quelle est la meilleure façon de rendre effectif une éducation de qualité pour chaque citoyen, quel qu'il soit, et à quelques niveaux de, 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 de là où il se trouve Peut-être. Et de, de ne pas dire que, on ne veut pas dire aux États et aux décideurs, n'investissez pas dans les outils numériques. Non. Mais on veut leur dire tout simplement que l'air numérique euh, a un coût, certes, mais il faut absolument qu'on n'oublie pas aussi le coût euh, d'investissement sur l'humain. Comment s'assurer qu'on se recentre sur l'humain? Si vous avez des enseignants qui ne sont pas formés, qui ne sont pas informés, qui ne sont pas outillés, qui ne savent même pas qu'est-ce que ça signifie et quels sont les instruments disponibles pour eux et qu'ils peuvent choisir pour atteindre leurs objectifs, il y a un problème. Si les enseignants, de plus en plus, et les enseignantes sont plutôt angoissés parce qu'il y a l'ère numérique et qu'ils ont euh, des difficultés à faire face à leurs apprenants et à leurs apprenantes qui sont peut-être mieux outillés parce que leurs parents les ont permis d'être plus outillés à la maison, euh, justement à cause, bien sûr, aussi de cette fracture euh, sociale qui existe entre, bien sûr, les enseignants aujourd'hui et certaines familles qui sont très aisées et qui sont dans cette dynamique d'acquisition euh, au quotidien de nouveaux outils et de nouveaux instruments. Là aussi, vous voyez, cette question, par exemple, de santé mentale euh, et de questions psychologiques euh, des enseignants il va falloir absolument en, prendre, euh, en tenir compte. Donc, pour nous, c'est de dire, euh, cet enjeu-là, il est à la fois énorme, euh, à la fois pour le personnel d'encadrement euh, de l'éducation, donc des enseignants, des inspecteurs, des conseils pédagogiques, mais jusqu'au personnel de l'administration et de gestion, mais aussi des apprenants et des apprenantes eux-mêmes. Parce qu'il y a aussi des filles ou des, des, des jeunes euh, qui ont des difficultés justement euh, à, à, à accéder à, à ces outils, mais surtout aussi à les accepter. Et, et toutes ces questions-là devraient, en termes de motivation et en termes d'explicitation, mais en termes de mise à niveau, doivent être vraiment des, des, as, des, des dynamiques et des aspects qui doivent être pris en compte. Donc, pour nous, c'est vraiment euh, de dire comment notre humanité euh, Sachant bien sûr que les questions de numérique, ça n'a pas démarré aujourd'hui. Ça fait déjà des décennies hein, euh, que cette question, en tout cas en termes d'introduction dans l'éducation, mais aussi dans notre société, euh, le numérique est, euh, a commencé déjà à percer depuis des décennies et des décennies. Donc, l'accélération due, bien sûr, à cette dimension du COVID devrait plutôt permettre à notre humanité de s'asseoir et comme j'ai dit dans, ma, dans, ma, dans mon rapport premier sur l'impact du COVID euh, sur, euh, bien sûr, euh, le système éducatif, c'est de dire, est-ce qu'on ne devrait pas euh, créer des espaces de dialogue pour avoir un peu une sorte de contrat social entre les différents acteurs? Et quand je dis entre les différents acteurs, ce sont les décideurs eux-mêmes, ce sont aussi les apprenants et les apprenantes, ce sont aussi les enseignants et les enseignantes, mais aussi ce sont les gestionnaires du système éducatif, mais c'est aussi le secteur privé euh, qui de plus en plus, et ça, c'est aussi un enjeu important et futur sur lequel il faut absolument pouvoir euh, continuer de construire. Parce qu'on constate que de plus en plus, le secteur privé, euh, vous voulez en parler tout à l'heure, et c'est énorme comme questionnement quand on voit euh, toutes ces publicités qui existent, autour des apprenants, autour des enseignants, mais autour aussi des gouvernements, des gouvernements pour qu'on achète de, des outils, pour qu'on achète des plateformes, euh, des instruments, etc., etc. 
Et on a l'impression que de plus en plus, si on ne prend pas garde, même les questions de vision du système éducatif, les questions de contenu, les questions de valeur, ce sera entre les mains, toutes ces questions-là seront entre les mains du secteur privé. Et ça, je pense que quelque part, il va falloir aussi euh, vraiment euh, s'assurer et mettre en exergue cette grosse question qui est essentielle. Et je parlais d'un autre acteur, je disais qu'il va falloir que ces acteurs s'assiedent, discutent, mais surtout construisent une perspective humaine, une perspective qui mette l'humain au centre, mais pas les technologies au centre euh, du processus. Et je parlais de ces acteurs, je, parle de, je viens de parler de, de l'acteur privé, mais je voudrais aussi parler de l'acteur famille, parce que le contexte du COVID-19 a absolument démontré la place essentielle, je dis bien la place essentielle que revêtent les familles dans, et les communautés euh, familiales dans ce processus éducationnel. Et pour moi, euh, cet espace-là, il faut absolument continuer à redonner aux familles leur espace, à les écouter et justement à les aider à s'organiser, mais surtout à prendre en compte leurs demandes, leurs besoins mais surtout aussi leur contexte et leur situation. Parce que quoi qu'on dise, tant qu'on n'a pas une situation holistique de l'ensemble de, de ces éléments, on peut toujours continuer à épiloguer, euh, mais on ne pourra pas aller très loin. Imaginez que vous ayez les meilleurs outils, les meilleurs instruments pour une famille euh, en milieu rural avec sept gosses ou neuf gosses euh, voilà, euh, dans un... Euh, voilà, dans une hutte, je ne sais pas comment, comment voudriez-vous, par exemple, que ces enfants-là puissent avoir cet, un petit espace pour eux. Donc, ça veut dire tout simplement que de plus en plus, dans des contextes de crise, l'éducation doit être repensée, revue et réanalysée et réadaptée à, au niveau de chaque contexte. En, si un enfant veut avoir de l'espace et qu'il y a sept autres, qui ont besoin de jouer, qui ont besoin de crier. Euh, voilà, comment il utilise euh, 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 son, son, son appareillage pour pouvoir se faire entendre avec son professeur. Ce n'est pas possible parce qu'il n'y a pas de logement décent. Vous voyez, donc, comment il y a un lien étroit entre justement même la présence des instruments et des outils et des appareillages les plus performants et à côté, bien sûr, euh, voilà, un espace qui est la famille euh, et, et la maison familiale. Et tant qu'il n'y a pas justement un logement décent, euh, ça pose problème et ça peut impacter négativement sur les apprentissages, bien sûr, euh, de, ces, de ces enfants et de ces élèves. Ceci dit, je ne veux pas non plus dire que euh, les outils numériques et la numérisation ne constitue pas un potentiel important et énorme pour le système éducatif, mais aussi pour les autres secteurs. C'est loin de là euh, mes propos. C'est clair que euh, la numérisation aide à régler, euh, pour souvent par exemple, les classes pléthoriques, aide à régler, à atteindre des zones inaccessibles, aide bien sûr euh, à soulager des enseignants euh, qui, qui doivent s'absenter euh, permettent aussi à des étudiants et à des apprenants ou à des apprenantes qui sont dans des contextes spécifiques d'autonomiser leur apprentissage, mais de centrer, parce qu'on parle toujours de pédagogie centrée sur l'apprenant ou l'apprenante, et effectivement, le numérique, dans certains cas, aide à, à construire cette dimension autonomisation, mais je dis, euh, et je continue encore de le, de, le, de le dire, ce potentiel, il est là. Il existe, mais le plus important, c'est comment on peut l'utiliser, c'est comment on peut l'adapter, mais c'est comment on peut le contextualiser pour s'assurer qu'on lui donne euh, beaucoup plus sa valeur humaine, sociétale, mais vraiment une société humaine, collective, réfléchie, euh, pour éviter, bien sûr, euh, euh, ce que certains euh, philosophes aiment dire, « science sans conscience n'est que ruine de l'homme ». Donc, pour moi, c'est vraiment s'assurer qu'on arrive à construire dans cette perspective 
euh, beaucoup plus humaine euh, et collective et sociale. Merci beaucoup. Et c'est toujours un plaisir partagé. Merci, merci beaucoup, uh, Dr. Bolivari, uh, pour votre intervention. Thank you very much for your intervention and indeed for pointing out that uh, even when tools are there, uh, it's about the accessibility for disadvantaged uh, parts of the population uh, that makes uh, the enjoyment more or less universal. And I think also an interesting aspect in terms of universality was also your link that you made to, to other rights, to the interconnectedness of rights to, to access. Uh, education, right to education meaningfully, and also the, the importance of, of the human here uh, in, in uh, um, teaching about the digitalization and, and well, also the, the different sectors that you mentioned. Let me uh, turn to our third speaker now, uh, please, uh, Yuval Shani. <clears throat> to complete the panel today, um, Yuval is, um, as I said before, a professor at Hebrew University, where he holds the Hirsch Lauterbach Chair in Public International Law. And among his many academic aff affiliations uh, are also visiting professorships at the Graduate Institute and the Geneva Academy. So we're happy for uh, another link here to us. Uh, Yuval also was a member of the UN Human Rights Committee from 2013 to 2020, holding functions such as co-rapporteur for new communications and interim measures and co-rapporteur for general comment number 36 on the right to life. He chaired this treaty body from 2018 to 2019. And also relevant for the discussion today, Yuval is your academic writing and the work you're undertaking on the evolving concept of digital rights, of e-rights, human rights in the context of cyber and the challenges it poses. So with this, where do uh, rights have to develop in order to remain universal and become universally respected, protected and fulfilled? We heard examples from some rights, but the list would be, of course, much longer. It would also go to freedom of expression and many others. So, Yuval, over to you, please. Thank you, uh, Felix, and thank you. Thanks, the Academy, for uh, inviting me. And I also uh, enjoyed listening to my uh, uh, two, uh, uh, two colleagues on the panel uh, speaking before me and covering much of the ground uh, that is also relevant to my presentation. So I, I fully agree with the proposition that we've heard that uh, digitalization is, uh, is, uh, should not be regarded necessarily as a threat to human rights, to the enjoyment of human rights, but it actually could serve as, um, as a tool for the advancement of, uh, of human rights, of universal human rights. Uh, we see that in areas such as political participation and human rights advocacy, where uh, new technology is being used to uh, mobilize, to participate, uh, to network. Uh, we see this uh, more generally in the sphere of uh, receiving and imparting information. Felix just mentioned freedom of expression. Uh, this is an area which is significantly uh, boosted by, uh, by uh, digitalization. Uh, ability to uh, access culture, ability to access education that we've heard about, ability to participate in a seminar like this one from uh, great distances. Uh, the, um, also in terms of uh, digital literacy, which is something I will return to, I think dig digitalization uh, is also part of the solution, not only part of the problem in terms of, um, of uh, disseminating information. And it is indeed also uh, an important tool for economic development, and it could help in closing or narrowing down uh, economic gaps, bridging of, over geographical gaps, etc. Uh, but as, as uh, my two predecessors and also Felix in his introductory remarks uh, made clear, there are also, of course, attendant risks uh, that have to be acknowledged and confronted. Uh, in many other panels, we are uh, concerned about the um, imbalance of power that has been created. And I'm, I'm speaking mainly now about the imbalance of power between users on the one hand and governments and technology companies on the other hand. Uh, so whereas there has been some element of empowerment of individuals through digitalization, there has been a much more dramatic uh, phenomenon of empowerment of companies and states as a result of digitalization and as a result in some important aspects of life that gap 
between those who have power, political power, economic power, technological power, and individuals has grown significantly. But of course, as we have heard, and this, is, this directly relates to the problem of universality, uh, this situation also creates new and very uh, uh, worrying gaps between different individuals and different groups of individuals across the world, but also inside, uh, inside countries. So uh, the gaps between the haves and the, the have-nots that uh, we often hear about in uh, discourse uh, about economic, social, and cultural rights uh, is increasingly uh, related to uh, the gap between the have internet access and the have not internet access as being in a way a key factor in being able to uh, access a digital economy and, and the various benefits that uh, accrue from that. And uh, this is also, of course, uh, uh, related not only to question of physical access, but also to questions we've heard Kumba mention education and the question of digital literacy is, is a critical issue here as well. And we are seeing a, a significant gap between those who have uh, digit, they do not have digital literacy uh, and those who are considered in some respect digital natives. Uh, and this is not only, again, a geographical gap, it is also an age gap. It has to do with the with access of different age groups to technology and to education about technology. Uh, I fully uh, sympathize with what Felix said before about the uh, uh, offline rights applicable online as a very good starting point for a discussion about the universality of digital rights, uh, but certainly not the end of the discussion uh, because uh, the existing rights that have been developed in the physical world, in the kinetic world, uh, do, have not anticipated, did not anticipate uh, many needs uh, and threats and challenges that are presented in the uh, digital age. And therefore, uh, we need to uh, think of how uh, we are going to address uh, these new needs and challenges. Uh, and we also need to also think about the new allocation of power, and especially like we've heard before, the, the rising significance of private actors, and to see how we can actually uh, reinterpret or readjust international human rights law so that it meets these challenges. So it's about the effectiveness of universal, of, un, of international law as a universal system of protection, but it's also about the reach of international human rights law as a system of protection, a reach across the digital divide, a reach across uh, the physical world towards the digital world, and also a reach uh, across uh, governments and other holders of uh, political and economic power. Uh, as Felix uh, mentioned, I've, I've, I've written on this uh, issue, um, on the issue of digital rights with a colleague of mine, a PhD student of mine by the name of Daphna Drosh-Polyansky. We have recently published an article that suggests that we uh, are already seeing some movement in the direction of the development of digital human rights and that this uh, development could be uh, catalogued into three different waves or generations of development. One is uh, what we call the first generation, that is the reinterpretation of existing human rights norms, so as they apply also to uh, digital challenges to protect uh, online users. So assembly, uh, we have heard about a freedom of assembly by Clement. Uh, we, uh, the Human Rights Committee in General Comment 37, which Clement helped us immensely to write, uh, did also extend the protection of offline assemblies also to online assemblies, and there had to be uh, some adjustments in this regard. Uh, privacy, freedom of expression, or other rights that uh, that requires significant um, interpretive uh, efforts in order to adjust them, uh, and also uh, equality and and education. We can talk a little bit more about these specific rights in the in the, in, in the discussion part. But there is also a second generation of rights, which are new rights. There are new attempts to formulate rights. Uh, this has still not happened so much at the global level, but it is increasingly happening at the regional level. 
uh, and sometimes at the national level. And, uh, and, and we are claiming in that article that it will sooner or later uh, may also end up in the, at the global level uh, through instruments such as Convention 108 plus, which is a Council of Europe convention, which is uh, extended uh, beyond the, the borders of Europe for, uh, for states to, to, to adhere to. Uh, and such rights could involve first and perhaps in first and foremost the right, the right of access to the internet, uh, which is both the right to access physically the internet, but also right to access the contents which are uh, located on the internet, which is of course a situation which in many countries is a problematic situation, both for physical, but also for political reasons. States are increasingly blocking access to certain internet sites. We are seeing this now uh, specifically in the context of, uh, of Russian um, measures uh, that have been taken following the, the invasion of Ukraine. And, and the uh, restrictions on access to certain contents. Uh, but there, there are other uh, rights that have been developed uh, along these trajectory. So within Europe, uh, we know of the right to be forgotten uh, as, uh, as, as, as a right that uh, implies a certain control over uh, personal data that is found uh, on the internet, uh, or more broadly, a right to informational self-determination uh, other aspects of uh, the right to control data, such as the right to uh, data uh, uh, portability, uh, right not to be subject to automated decision making, right to cybersecurity, and very recently in the in the EU declaration on digital rights and principles for the digital age that had been adopted uh, by the European um, Commission uh, in uh, two months ago. There was also a specific reference to the right to a digital legacy for, uh, for, for persons after they pass away, though they have a control over their uh, internet or online footprint, and also uh, the right to digital identity, so that in the individuals are, are able to individualize their participation uh, online. And then we have a third generation of rights uh, that, uh, in fact, we, we, we posit uh, covers, uh, that pr protects also non-physical uh, persons, namely digital persons, which could be uh, the ways in which per individuals choose to interact with the outer world. And, and we submit that these digital persons, digital identities, uh, could also be the holders of certain rights and more significantly, uh, obligations uh, which are imposed on on, on, in, on uh, technology companies, such as online platforms that are fulfilling in some respect uh, roles which are parallel to governments, especially in, in the area of uh, content moderation, where uh, the control of the of public debate is now increasingly exercised not by governments, but by technology companies. Uh, these new rights and new frameworks also come with new justifications and new theories for rights. So it's not just a mechanical transposition of rights from the offline to the online. There has to be significant heavy lifting in terms of identifying, define, redefining rights, uh, reasserting theories of rights, and also creating new uh, mechanisms for implementing and enforcing rights. So, for instance, the visit that Clement had in the, in, in the Silicon Valley, this is uh, a great initiative, but it's not a structural process in which the human rights world is responding to this uh, new uh, reality. In the interest of time, I, I will just uh, note that uh, this, uh, of course, development of new rights does create a challenge does create challenges for the uh, for the uh, notion of universality because uh, these rights are going at least in the short term they are going to proceed more quickly in regions of the world that are more embedded in in digital economy than in other regions and i think this is an important concern and i think this is why it is important that the development of these rights will not take place only in certain affluent regions of the world, but there has to be a role for global bodies such as the UN and the various UN agencies in contributing to this process of uh, developing digital rights. So the voice of people, for instance, from the global south is heard uh, more strongly 
with the needs and expectations uh, which are uh, presented in this regard. And I think it is also uh, critical to find ways to uh, advance in this direction of uh, fine tuning existing human rights, but also building on existing human rights without weakening the baseline that we already have. I mean, having uh, universal human rights is, is an immense achievement that the international community has, 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 has obtained in the years that have, uh, that have gone since 1945. And it, it, we need to find ways to drive the message that the fact that we are developing existing human rights, which are more specific, more uh, carefully tailored to the needs of the digital age, does not mean that the default rules that exist uh, are no longer irrelevant, no longer important, uh, no uh, longer applicable, because at the end of the day, I would argue that the, the new rights and the new right configurations do stem either from, uh, from protected interests that we already are, have decided to protect through existing rights, or from the underlying values of the human rights uh, uh, movement, which would be human dignity, human liberty, equality. So in that regard, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a completely new uh, feature. It's, it's really an adaptation of the principles of human rights law for a new uh, reality. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, you all, for this intervention and indeed for <coughs> outlining both uh, the positive aspects, the uh, idea of being part of the solution, uh, the issues that you say, uh, just in, in concluding, uh, that are opposed to universality of human rights in the development of those e rights. And I think very interesting also, and uh, well, I would prefer probably to speak of waves than of generations. The terminology of generations in human rights, I think, has done also maybe sometimes more harm than clarity, but those waves that also, and I think also mentioned that too, can be uh, in parallel in a way, as the certainly first and second wave might be going along in different areas at the same time. So, so very, very interesting points here. Now we have half an hour left for our discussion, and I'd like to invite, of course, all of uh, you, your panelists, to uh, enter into a conversation with each other, posing question on each other's presentation. But at this point, I would also like to open the floor for all the participants in this meeting to pose your questions. Um, you can pose them in the chat, but also uh, we are not such a huge group, so you can just uh, request the floor. We're in a Zoom meeting setting, which means that you'll be able to just switch on your camera and microphone and ask the questions directly or any other contributions that you'd like to do to this conversation. So with this, I would like to uh, throw open the floor for anyone who'd like to ask some questions, comment on the presentations and on the topic at hand of digitalization and universality of human rights. Quickly checking the chat if we have anyone coming in. So yes, and uh, I see a, 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 yes, a, a real hand being raised uh, by Domenico Zipoli, please yes. Raise your hands if you raise your electronic hands also. I will see that also and it will help me do a list of speakers. But so over to uh, Domenico Zipoli, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felix. And thank you all for uh, such an interesting uh, discussion and um, for providing insights uh, on uh, how the, the impact of digitalization has um, forwarded and proceeded. Uh, in the work of your uh, different mandates. I would have uh, two questions, um, one of a more general nature and one perhaps um, directed more on um, the, um, the discussion related to, to e-rights and uh, the concept of these three, uh, three generations that, uh, uh, that Yuval um, wrote in his, in his um, interesting uh, article. Uh, so the first question, um, so it would really be to, to for, for all of you, uh, um, is um, regarding the procedural aspect of digitalization. We've heard a lot about the impact, the substantive impact of digitalization on um, on the on the on the many different rights that your that your mandates uh, deal with. Um, I was wondering if you could share with us how digitalization has impacted uh, your work as uh, special rapporteurs and uh, or as member of of a of a treaty body, 
and uh, whether the the um, the efforts done uh, so far are enough and what what can be done in order to really uh, make use uh, of um, well this this uh, increased increased uh, support for digitalized digitalization that we've seen during these last uh, uh, two years we were kind of forced to, to ramp up the digitalization curve uh, uh, here in Geneva with the mechanisms but I believe in in, in every country that uh, that we're all in so that would be my first question um, so re relating to the digitalization and the work of the mechanisms and and how that is impacting your work uh, which then eventually would impact uh, the um, our theme of today which is that of uh, the universality and the second is um, uh, Yuval, you you mentioned um, at some point the fact that yes we have different threads uh, that relate to the to the three the three um, generations uh, but they are uh, specific to either the mechanism that is acting upon it such as uh, your general comment 37 um, you've mentioned a convention at the um, council of europe level you've mentioned the role of tech companies how could then this more structured process perhaps at a un level um, how would you see that more um, comprehensive approach uh, be taken by um, i would think the united nations but maybe maybe a broader spectrum of actors thank you Thank you very much. Thank you, Domenico, for your questions. And uh, I'd like to give the floor to Pedro Jose Martinez. Um, hi, everyone. I, yeah, I think you can hear me. Uh, thank you. Uh, my, my question uh, is uh, direct to well, anyone who wants to take it, but uh, I think uh, Professor Shani was uh, kind of touching upon the closest to, to this issue. So my question is about the role of, this, of the state in this uh, new digital era and vis-a-vis and, and, and -vis the, the, the universality of human rights. Of course, uh, private companies can play, play a, or are called to play a, a, an important role in, in moderating uh, and in handling the use of, of digital technologies uh, and in guaranteeing uh, the access, the universal access uh, uh, of everyone to precisely to the exercise of human rights online. Uh, where does this leave the state, in fact? And uh, how, how can the state best uh, take a hold of the situation and, and deal and regulate uh, uh, the work of, of private companies in this regard? Um, I... I as I said, I think Professor Shani was kind of uh, uh, kind of going into this direction, but perhaps uh, a little bit more of insight in this uh, this point would be great. Thank you very much. And uh, um, I don't know if there's further questions uh, right now. Otherwise, we take this first round. There was also a remark in the chat about uh, human rights uh, in hybrid conflict settings. So actually. I think there too, um, we make a bridge in a way from human rights to humanitarian law of how to protect uh, the human, how, how to enhance, well, ensure human rights protection actually in hybrid conflicts. So there too, I think, uh, well, uh, it's definitely a very interesting topic where ourselves uh, also <coughs> at the Geneva Academy in a project with the uh, ICRC looking at the digital battlefield. And obviously, I think it's an area where a lot of human rights considerations come in additionally to humanitarian law questions. But so with this, um, and uh, just checking if anything else was in the chat, that's what we have. So with this, if I could give it back to, to our speakers. Um, so if we may just go in the same order as before. And uh, Clément, if I could start with you. Yes. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Felice, and uh, thanks also for those who ask uh, uh, questions. Um, I just wanted to say that, yes, uh, as I mentioned, digital uh, technology, or what we call in general digital age, um, while expanding and also uh, building the capacity of community to both exercise their rights, because it's important to, to, to also say that our smartphone today, that it's on our hand, is also our freedom. But at the same time, we can also offer the space where we exercise many rights. And I think this is what's one of the discussion that we have within the general comments. Um, 
I think it, it also comes with a lot of threats, as I mentioned. But at the, at the, at the same time, uh, one can also uh, 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 say that um, when it comes, for example, the, us as a special rapporteur, that's your first question. Uh, I think COVID-19 shows really um, the challenge and also the lack of preparedness of our system to really be embedded in these digital movements. And we know that at the beginning we take the, it was so, it was, a little, it was really hard for us to be involved, uh, to, to really capture the, uh, this opportunity. And most of us also will learn using those platforms during this period. But unfortunately, one of the things that, and let me be honest, that we, 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 we continue to regret is that although some of the lesson learned, I'm not sure that our mechanism have been prepared currently or have been prepared in, to face any future uh, pandemic where we will need to use this. Even if it's not pandemic, but how do we use dig those digital means today to enhance our work as an expert, as a working group? Today, we don't have that. So I don't, I'm not seeing, I mean, unless I'm from my side, I'm not seeing how the system is equipped to do, to do this work. And, this is as an important because if we talk about the universality, if we talk about uh, uh, the importance of digital uh, age on protection of human rights, we need also to ensure that experts are themselves equipped enough to be able also to work on this digital sphere, to be able also to, to, to empower and to increase and to strengthen their work with these kind of tools. But today, uh, that's not something that I, I'm seeing. And unfortunately, we have been seeing, saying that. And I hope that COVID-19, the lesson learned that we can take from the COVID-19 is exactly how really uh, uh, to, we, we need to prepare ourselves on that. And another thing I would like also to comment on, and uh, I think we need also to look at, um, uh, from my perspective, uh, and uh, during the general comment and the process, we discussed this and company also regarding it. This the digital transformation and then the digital age is, is, is a world that is really important. And the technology we have today, in, a, in one week or in 10 days, it will change. So it becomes quite difficult in terms of regulating those technology and regulating also the right that should be exercised with this technology. That's how we need also to be uh, uh, careful how state regulates those technology in the in, in the world that this technology is involving every day. How do we uh, uh, ensure that everyone can ha have access to this technology? Where we know that today and probably in two two years we will be moving to another technology, while other continents will be also only capturing the the, the first uh, generation of technology. So this is why for me is important to always make sure that we, we both talk about the inter independence and interlinkage between the civic, the, 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 the physical space and the online space. In the sense that we are not asking state today to regulate the whole uh, space for its right, but to protect it as a, the space card that can enhance the enjoyment of this right that are recognized. I'm not sure today if you open another convention in terms of uh, recognizing these specific rights, we will have a convention that uh, is more protective. Let me see, let me look at what is happening in cyber crime law today. The state willing today is really to suppress these rights. States are seeing those space sometimes as a being space of threat because why? These space are the space that open our, expand our political rights, they expand our democratic rights. So these are some of the challenges that um, uh, when people ask me, our states will, states have obligation to protect and general comment 37 also make it clear. Space need to protect the exercise of these rights. Protection means, uh, is it the protection means to regulate this space? I'm not quite sure what we will open. I will always argue and say that uh, we have companies today, uh, technology companies today, they are the one really have this ability to police online and they need to be abide by the framework the 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 the, the, guide, the, the guiding uh, principle which always emphasizes that any technology that we invite we need to make sure and assess its impact on human rights this is why today we are saying that when it comes to the surveillance when it comes to the cct camera 
facial recognition. Some of those technology today that shows that they violate fundamental freedom, either we need to impose moratorium on the use of technology, or either we need also to see how these technologies are regulated in a way that they are not affecting the enjoyments of uh, fundamental freedoms. Um, but moving, um, um, I, I, I would say that, um, yes, I, I, I would say that today, uh, the, the digital world is the one that both uh, enhance our rights, but also at the same time, also it creates this kind of uh, challenging on uh, obligation versus enjoyment of this right and how far uh, open up another discount. For example, we know that in the principle today, I mean, uh, Professor, you, have, you talk about the e-rights and I think uh, that's important. Today we have the right to access and it's a, all the resolution recognize the access to internet as an important element. But it says it, this means that the internet should be regulated by the state in sense that the same regulation and same proportionality and the same convention as uh, we have offline. It's a discussion ongoing, but I think that we have to be careful on how really uh, uh, the regulation, online regulation can be one way of state even cartel or fundamental. I, I, for example, give one example on how today online space is important and expand the ability of people to mobilize offline when it comes to protests, when it comes to online. Also today, to some states are talking about how online violence can be identity, can be also uh, somebody that uh, posts something online can be held accountable for being uh, for impacting offline violence when his post is read by how many number of the people. So you, you can see that the complexity of making sure that we don't uh, both open up this regulation uh, on online which is a susceptible to impact the actual physical enjoyment of, uh, of our fundamental freedom guarantee by the components. So I, I will leave it then for now. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for expanding on that, Clément. And <clears throat> we'll see whether we we'll also have time to get into a third round and, and also some questions also maybe from the others there, there to you. But let me uh, go directly on uh, to the second speaker, Kumba Bolivari. So Kumba also, uh, in terms of reactions to the comments, the questions heard before, the floor is yours. Merci. Uh, merci beaucoup, M. Kishmer. Um, donc, je, je voudrais appuyer très fortement ce que mon collègue voulait vient de dire uh, tout à l'heure uh, pour reconnaître tout simplement que uh, c'est vrai que l'impact de cette numérisation sur notre propre travail en tant que rapporteur spécial, euh, il a été à différents niveaux. D'abord au niveau individuel, euh, parce qu'il va, il a fallu effectivement se réorganiser soi-même pour s'assurer euh, justement qu'on ait un espace pour pouvoir continuer à faire le travail de rapporteur spécial. Avant, on devait aller faire des visites pays. Uh, c'était des voyages, il fallait aller rencontrer les gens directement, les questionner, uh, et humainement, ça fait sens. Parce que le travail que nous faisons, il est tellement délicat parce qu'il est lié aussi aux droits de l'homme, uh, donc aux droits humains, et il y a certains acteurs qui n'aimeraient pas justement, qui ne peuvent pas s'exprimer ou qui ne veulent pas se faire entendre, uh, tant qu'il n'y a pas peut-être cette dimension de proximité. Et ça, C'est aussi un impact sur la qualité des informations, certainement, que nous pouvons recueillir aussi au niveau des pays, au niveau des acteurs. Donc, pour moi, ça, ça constitue aussi un défi à la fois au niveau individuel, mais aussi au niveau institutionnel. Parce que quelque part, il faut pouvoir s'équiper. Et vous savez très bien que euh, le mandat de rapporteur spécial n'est pas un mandat renuméré. Donc, il faut prendre sur les ressources de la personne pour pouvoir s'équiper. Et ça, ça a été pour la, toute la, pour ne pas dire, c'est, c'est tous les rapporteurs spéciaux sont tous à la, et toutes à la même enseigne. Et c'est important de le dire, euh, parce que ça, les équipements, ce n'est pas quelque chose qui est prévu, effectivement, au niveau des Nations Unies. Et chaque rapporteur 
doit pouvoir euh, s'équiper et s'assurer que quelque part, euh, tout le travail qui va continuer en ligne, il a euh, la possibilité de le faire, euh, d'avoir cette euh, connexion Internet, d'avoir des instruments qui sont adaptés, d'avoir aussi un espace adapté pour ça, etc., etc. Donc, il a fallu toute une infrastructure derrière, mais la construction aussi d'une certaine compétence euh, derrière, euh, en amont, pour pouvoir s'assurer que le travail puisse continuer. Euh, il y a pas mal de rapporteurs spéciaux qui n'ont pas pu faire les visites pays, parce qu'il y a eu, bien sûr, ce contexte euh, de COVID. Donc, au niveau méthodologique, il a fallu encore réinventer la façon d'organiser le travail avec les équipes qui sont en Genève. Moi, je prends mon exemple concret et je voudrais vraiment saisir encore cette opportunité pour féliciter l'équipe du secrétariat euh, au niveau des Nations Unies à Genève qui a accompagné le mandat de l'éducation pendant cette période de crise du COVID. Euh, malgré ce contexte difficile où vous savez très bien que pratiquement euh, une bonne partie de l'humanité, donc y compris ses collègues, ont été tomb sont, sont tombés malades ou eu leurs parents malades ou d'autres ont eu, euh, qui ont perdu même hein, euh, une partie de leur famille euh, due au COVID. Et ça, je vais dire, c'est aussi euh, euh, ou qui ont eu voilà, des, des, des difficultés hein, euh, liées à la santé, justement à toute cette angoisse, à toute cette dimension de comment il faut euh, réduire le stress pour s'assurer qu'on continue d'assumer le travail. Et l'équipe de Genève, vous savez, quand il y a eu euh, ce COVID, l'équipe du mandat de l'éducation, très rapidement, j'ai décidé de changer de thématique pour travailler sur le thème euh, de l'impact du COVID sur l'éducation. Donc, vous voyez, ça demandait à cette équipe assez rapidement euh, de se re reconvertir pour développer une nouvelle, une nouvelle thématique, tant au niveau méthodologique, au niveau de la collaboration avec les acteurs, mais aussi euh, euh, voilà, au niveau conceptuel. Et pour moi, ça a été vraiment euh, une très, très, très belle leçon euh, de vie, euh, parce que ça a été un contexte très difficile, mais ça a démontré comment des êtres humains, quand ils sont sur le même engagement, sur la même vision, sur comment aider et soutenir notre humanité, chacun et chacune est prêt et prête à donner le meilleur de lui-même. Et ça fonctionne. Et nous avons pu produire ce rapport. Donc, c'est vraiment pour dire aussi que, et merci aussi à tous les partenaires, euh, y compris euh, euh, l'Académie voilà, de, de Genève, parce que nous avons eu des informations, par exemple, provenant de ces acteurs qui sont aussi nos collaborateurs proches. Et ça, je pense que c'est vraiment une, euh, une dimension de, euh, voilà, collective, hein, de, 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 vraiment de travail collaboratif et, et sincère. Et ça, je crois que c'est aussi pour moi euh, quelque chose de très fort que je retiens euh, de, de, de cet impact. Peut-être euh, la... Voilà. Sorry. Donc, juste conclure, juste yeah. pour conclure. Euh, on a tous parlé de, de mécanismes au niveau international qui doit être porté par les Nations unies pour s'assurer que nous ayons, bien sûr, cette dimension de, de mécanisme qui puisse à la fois prévenir, organiser de façon éthique et juridique. Mais j'ai dit, n'oublions pas de consulter la base. Tant que ça restera encore les mêmes enjeux et les mêmes personnes et les, au niveau du pouvoir de décision, les mêmes qui décideront, l'humanité continuera, bien sûr, de balbutier. Donc, pour moi, c'est... C'est juste ça que je voudrais vraiment dire aussi en termes de conclusion. Merci beaucoup. Merci, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. And indeed, you covered the ground also how the mandates themselves were impacted by the COVID crisis and thus also reacted to digitalization. So I think it was also going to one of the questions. Mm -hmm. And surely the treaty bodies, treaty body members who are in a similar situation have also suffered some of those experiences. But so, Yuval, uh, of course, you could also comment on this still as a former treaty body member, but I think there were also a number of questions very directly addressed to you also thematically. So I'd like to rather have you dedicate the remaining minutes. Uh, we have uh, eight minutes until the end of the meeting um, to, to address those questions. So over to you, Yuval. 
Thank you, Felix. Uh, and thank uh, all participants for questions and, and remarks, including my uh, two distinguished colleagues. Um, so, so yes, the treaty bodies also had to uh, move really on the fly from uh, offline meetings, from physical meetings to online meetings. Actually, the Human Rights Committee was in session when Palais Wilson was closed down because of COVID in March 2020. Uh, and we had to cut down a meeting. Uh, and then, uh, and of course, at the time when I spoke with some, with the secretariat about maybe we will transfer to Zoom, uh, most of the people I spoke to have never heard of Zoom. So there has been uh, some uh, learning curve uh, in that regard. And I agree with Clement that there has been, that I, there was no contingency plan. Uh, for this, and and I think it was very difficult. This moved uh, to an online meeting uh, platform, and of course, it's very different for a collective body that has to meet online and has to uh, accept decisions typically by consensus than the special rapporteurs, who of course have many other challenges, but they do not have. This is the one challenge that 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 they do not have, which is to reach decisions uh, with others uh, on a collective basis. And this is uh, something that eventually we did. The Human Rights Committee did have two online sessions. Uh, and I think the experience that we have had is that this is doable. It is doable in the sense that you can get some work done. You can finalize a general comment. You can also... Uh, uh, um, dispose of uh, individual communications, which are not too complicated. Uh, and there has been afterwards, after I left, there has also been some experience with state reviews that uh, on the whole was, um, did go uh, relatively well. But I think, the, I think the bottom line is that this is really second best. So this is really something that can be done but it lacks uh, an important aspect, not to mention the many technological issues and, and, and problems. Uh, it lacks the uh, direct and informal dimension of, uh, of the work uh, of the committees uh, between committee members, vis-a-vis -vis secretariats, vis-a-vis -vis states. And I think it ultimately also affects the quality of, of the work, uh, especially when uh, uh, new members have to be brought in, in into a committee and they have not gone through the informal uh, uh, indoctrination, so to speak, inculcation. So, so I think this is not a, I mean, this is something that can be used, uh, of course, in emergency cases. It can also be used as a supplementary uh, format to uh, if there is a, a need to meet a, a, an increasingly heavy load and transfer parts of the work, the easy parts of the work to online, but it certainly cannot be the main uh, modus operandi of a treaty body. And I would uh, imagine also not of a special rapporteur uh, for holding a visit. Um, and I think there is a risk here that for the UN system, it's a cheaper way to conduct business. This has to be clear because there are no per diem which are paid, no flight expenses. And I think we uh, who, are, uh, who are within the, inside the system or monitoring the system should be wary about uh, a, a, an aggressive push of technology as a substitute uh, to physical presence. I think also those of us who are teaching can, can testify that uh, teaching online, the teaching online uh, could be, again, a second best uh, alternative, but it's not the same thing. Uh, so this but, is my uh, comment about mm -hmm. digitalization. Yes, and, and so on the questions uh, asked before also by some of the, the participants, I think you had a question also linking uh, yeah. digital hybrid conflicts. And well, I'll, I'll just uh, pass it over to you again just to, to add yeah. maybe on those substantive uh, points that were raised before. Okay, uh, so, so first I can't resist to comment on your generation comment, which I think is a good comment because the terminology of generations indeed is somewhat controversial, although it is very well known, but uh, at least in this, the, the reason we chose the word generations is simply to bridge to the technology world where there is also 3G, 4G, 5G, 
So it actually, we, we, there is a term which is used both in human rights and in technology, which we thought is, a, is an interesting way. Regarding the standard setting, this is a very important question. How do you go forward? And I think we do have some good models. We do have the business and human rights model, which I think is an interesting way where actually a rapporteur uh, started rolling the ball and then guidelines were created and then that now a treaty is being uh, ironed out. So I think this is perhaps a good model also, also for this content. I think here it's the UN is important, but the UN has to work in a multi-stakeholder uh, arena. So bodies such as the Internet Governance Forum could be, for instance, uh, utilized. I will also note that uh, states also have a role to play in regulating. I think it's very difficult for a single state to regulate, but when a group of states such as the EU come together and pass, uh, like they just recently did the Digital Services Act, uh, you do have this Brussels effect because then you have a significant economic block which is changing uh, the regulatory environment uh, for, for companies. And I think we're gonna see regulation not so much via state by state, but increasingly through blocks of state. It would be good if we find ways to uh, globalize uh, this uh, process. And maybe a final comment on this uh, is that I think regulation of technology has to be increasingly down through the technology itself. So I think we have to find ways to integrate the human rights into technological design. So we have rights by design, and this is uh, this requires again a different form of uh, modus operandi. Uh, the focus is not so much in after the fact um, uh, handling of problems is actually in before the fact regulation of technological standards, so that the engineers are already introducing uh, the, the various aspects of rights into the technology. This so just one word on Russia. Uh, uh, yes, I think. Uh, Actually, the area of criminal law or humanitarian law has benefited so far from more treatment than digital human rights. And we have seen processes such as the Tallinn process that NATO uh, sponsored, where really the application of uh, humanitarian law in, in cyberspace has been uh, quite comprehensively thought about. And there are some uh, multi uh, multilateral processes which are fleshing out some issues, such as the use of autonomous weapon systems, etc. Uh, I think we need to do uh, more also in the human rights field to catch up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yuval. And that brings us to the conclusion of our event today, of our conversation today. And I think it was also nice to hear you with uh, maybe three uh, quite concrete points, as we always also like to say uh, of those discussions that, as uh, Clément reminded us in the very beginning of this event, could take uh, much longer than an hour and a half. So going away from such a conversation, obviously, we will not have answered all the questions. But if we have some points of what are next steps, what is really the areas to, to look at and to, to work on, I, I think your, your modeling, uh, Yuval, for example, that you mentioned uh, with the business and human rights example, use of existing fora like the IGF, and definitely the regulation being built in and rights by design is also a way forward that I would see in the, in the link of human rights and, and um, digitalization. And that to bring it back, of course, also then to, to our topic of universality, how exactly such built-in design could also potentially be a step forward in, in the universal application of human rights, uh, where the, <clears throat> um, the decision is not necessarily neither left to AI nor just to a private actor, but, but built in when we speak of content management, for example, into those, um, into those structures. Now, um, concluding our meeting today, I will just, I'm just left to thank all of you. So thank you. Uh, thank you to the speakers. Thank you to the interpreters and to all of those who have participated in the meeting. Thank you for having been there. I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. And I'd like to also uh, encourage all of you to, of course, uh, stay tuned, uh, watch uh, previous human rights conversations, uh, also get our newsletter to be informed of upcoming human rights conversations. And I also already want to announce um, that uh, with with what I will close here, that the annual conference of this year of the Geneva Human Rights Platform will look at digital connectivity. So we will be continuing the discussions on that topic, and I'm very much looking forward to staying in touch with you all on that. 
with this, uh, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, day or night, wherever you are. Thank you very much for having participated and uh, goodbye.